For those joining us for the first time, SDA is a not-for-profit arts advocacy organization established in 2002 by a group of artists and drama educators. SDA attained charity status in year 2020. Our purpose is to advance the profession of the drama and theater educator and advocate for the practice and value of drama theater in performance, education, and, <laughs> and community. Connections is a non-partisan platform for connecting stakeholders in education sector through open dialogues on current challenges, issues, and developments with the aim to inspire change. For Connections 2022, we will be taking a deep dive into the topic of safeguarding of children in the arts. We had a fruitful time this morning discussing safeguarding of children in the arts in the Singapore context. And for a panel this afternoon, we will be looking at some frameworks and practices of safeguarding policies in Singapore. Today, we are privileged to have Dr. Charlene Rajendran as our moderator of the panel. Dr. Charlene Rajendran is a theatre educator, dramaturg, and researcher at the National Institution of Education, Nyang Nyang Technology University, Singapore. She is the co-director of Asian Dramaturg Network and the lead editor of ADN Review. As a practice-led academic, she publishes in varied spaces and works on interdisciplinary and community arts project. If you have any questions, feel free to drop them at our Slido page and enter the code which will be shown on, our, on the screen. For those who need help, please feel free to get in touch with any of our ushers or administrators on our Zoom. We also have our friends from Equal Dreams doing speech to text interpretation. Please go to the link on the screen to gain access to the document. You can also find the link on our Zoom. Over to you, Charlene. Thank you very much, Tabitha. Uh, thank you, everyone. And thank you to all of you for being here, particularly our panelists, Bernice Lee, Azhar Yusuf, and Deborah Young, whom I have the pleasure of moderating in a discussion this afternoon's session. I'll introduce them more thoroughly in a while. Uh, thank you, SDEA, for inviting me to moderate this session, because as a result, I am learning about this area, safeguarding of children in the arts, which is at present an undeveloped area, admittedly so for a range of different reasons. Hence, on our panel today are not just arts educators. In fact, we have someone from sports and we have someone from a religious organization as well as someone who's an artist and arts educator because clearly this is work that needs to learn across disciplines and we need to understand what each other are doing to make sense of this very important work of basically protecting the child who is in a precarious position but also able to understand more than we often give the child credit for. So this morning's discussion opened up a few areas of interest and Broadly speaking, there is the aspect of policy and guidelines that need to be developed and implemented and shared and made available. And there is also the question of what does it mean to be an educator? What is the role of an educator? What is the responsibility? What are the limits and boundaries of this person who takes on the task of being an educator? And what's the role of the learner? So these are broad areas of questioning and learning and unlearning maybe that we need to take on and so I really look forward to what our panelists are going to share with us and talk about. Uh, the structure of this afternoon's session is as follows. Each of our presenters will speak for about 10 minutes and then we will have a discussion among the panelists to start off for about 20 minutes and then we'll open to the floor and the floor in this sense means people who are present here as well as those who are watching online and are sending in questions on Slido. So you have the option of typing in your questions or I guess you know if you're here, you can raise your hand later on. And we hope that this begins a process of discussion. Yeah? Uh, SDA is working towards developing some kinds of guidelines, policies, working processes that can be user-friendly. Because at the end of the day, what's the point of all this talk if it leads nowhere? Uh, so think about it in that way, that this is not about arriving at solutions in one afternoon, but starting a process and continuing to learn from each other and think about what else is needed. Okay, so with that, let me introduce our panelists. 
we have Mr. Azhar Yusof, who is head of Coach, Coach SG at Sport Singapore. And in his role at Coach SG, he leads the coaching education and development efforts across all sports. He also oversees the Safe Sport Task Force that aims to safeguard sport and ensure that participants may engage in sport in a positive and safe environment. Azha has a diverse background, having been a national athlete, an international match official, and a coach in multiple sports. He's a teacher by training. He headed the PE and CCA department Raffles Institution before joining the National Institute of Education, although we've never met in NIE, sadly. <laughs> Maybe, we've crossed paths, but we've never actually said hello. How sad is that? And he is Senior Lecturer and Assistant Head of Teaching. So welcome, Azha. Nice to finally meet you. Um, Bernice Lee is an artist, performer, writer, and dance practitioner. She co-directs Roly Poly Family and Daring Do Dance with Faye Lim. And they are known for their signature Body Smarts Through Movement Arts programs, teaching body safety, consent, and boundaries, they advise and consult on safeguarding practices for children. Roly Poly Family is dedicated to honouring children's creative genius and caring about children's perspectives. Moving and playing are central to their art making. Welcome, Bernice. Good to work with you again. And finally, Deborah Young is deaconess in charge of the safeguarding team at Zion Bishan Bible Presbyterian Church. The team's objectives are to foster a safe church culture and environment in order to prevent abuse and neglect and to assist the church in responding to any instance of such harm. As part of the team, Deborah, who is legal trained by the way, has been involved in formulating safeguarding policies as well as conducting and training for church leaders and volunteers on abuse awareness, safe practices and incident reporting. Thank you, Deborah, for being willing to share your work with us. Okay, so what we'll do now is hand over to you, Azha. Yes. Thanks, Charlene. I've been in NIE for, uh, was in NIE for 12 years, yeah? But uh, this is the first time we're, we're talking to each other. <laughs> How strange. But thanks for the introduction. Hi, everyone. Um, I first want to thank SDA for, for the invitation and for the opportunity to share um, our efforts in safeguarding in sport. And I think, Charlene, you, you kind of uh, hit the nail on the head there when you said that safeguarding is not something that is in sport alone or in arts alone, but it crosses all boundaries, right? It's really about safeguarding kids particularly and the vulnerable. So really happy to be here and to share. And I'm sure I will learn a lot more from uh, what others are sharing as well. So let me begin by asking all of you here and even those online, how many of you are familiar with the term safe sport? I can't see those people online, but at least I can see those people here. All right, wonderful. <laughs> Good to know that uh, quite a number of you are familiar with the term. Uh, but unfortunately, the term is not quite well known across even the sporting fraternity. They are very familiar with sport safety, but not safe sport. And this is what is defined or how it is defined um, by IOC. So as an athletic environment that is respectful, equitable and free from non-accidental violence. This is off the IOC consensus statement, right, back in uh, 2016. And under the definition, we are looking at the umbrella for abuse, harassment, mistreatment, maltreatment, gender-based violence, and interpersonal violence. But underneath of it, there are actually much, much more or many more that we sometimes do not see. Especially now with uh, the advent of online social media and all that, some of these things are invisible. Bullying, body shaming, trolling, and what have you. So I think it is something that's concerned for us and that's why in 2016 it came up to the fore quite a bit and hence the, the, the term safe sport was coined. So not too long ago and this was uh, at the recent Olympic Games yeah, in 2022, um, the uh, Winter Olympics, we had a case of abuse right, and humiliation and on the right there, yet another case of bullying and that led to, um, you know, uh, death. I think that's something that we certainly do not want to see in any of the sectors, whether it's sport, whether it's arts or anything else. So if we go back in time, what I said earlier about how this was it really started off by the infamous, now infamous case of Dr. Larry Nasser, the US gymnastics coach, uh, and the many inappropriate things that he did to so many women. Yeah? 
But it is not a problem with a doctor. It is a problem in many, many different roles that you have uh, played out in the sporting fraternity. So you have the coach, um, you have athletes against athletes, you have uh, sport administrators. So it is not a coaching problem, it is not a medical doctor's problem, it is not a sports administrator's problem, it's everywhere. And you see here, all over the world, there are issues around say sport. And here in Asia, we are not spared as well. So say sport knows no boundaries, right? So the recent cases also involve those who are in Asia, in Korea, uh, in Japan, and so on. And the same uh, can be said for Singapore. So again, I said earlier that uh, it knows, both, knows no more boundaries, and uh, these are the cases of say sport here in Singapore, right? So this is something that is concerned for us. Um, and I said earlier about how some of these things are not criminal in nature, but yet it is something that we need to guard against. Um, and that's why we started the Safe Sport Movement here in Singapore in 2018. So about two years after the Larry Nassar case. In 2019, we um, started the Safe Sport Commission, an independent body looking at this, not connected to any agency. Yeah. So, the spectrum of behaviours as you can see here. And there are new threats posed by what I said earlier about virtual environments, right? Because Singapore is well connected, so 90% of our youth aged 15 to 19 are using social networking sites, right? And that's the reason why in 2020, there was amendments to the penal code that includes now voyeurism, upskirting, unsolicited intimate images, cyber flashing, and so on. Secondly, it's not limited to types. Um, and we can see that no significant differences can be found with regard to age, level of performance, whether you are in the learn-to-play community space versus the elite. There's no, no boundaries, not limited to types. And then finally, everyone responsible. I'm wearing a, a safe spot band here, um, and it says that everyone has a part to play. Play your part, right? So everyone is responsible because it involves all levels of communica uh, communication or participation, rather. It is not a coach-athlete problem. All participants or all um, participants can be affected. Volunteers, sport administrators, support staff, doctors, and so on. Right? So that's why we are concerned. If you look at the, the cases that are reported, that's the tip of the iceberg right there at the top, right? And typically, those are the ones that led to criminal convictions. Then it gets reported in the newspapers and so on, right? But Underneath that iceberg is this huge piece of ice, right? How many police charges have been made that didn't result in conviction, right? How many formal reports have been made? How many informal disclosures? How many anonymous self-report and how many actual experiences? So what we have found is there has been a significant increase in that. Significant increase in uh, those that are reported as well. Psychological misconduct, 87%. Psychological misconduct in inappropriate acts, uh, acts, 56%. So these are the things that we are seeing uh, here in Singapore as well as all over the world. The cases general report that was uh, published in 2021 talks about how this is a concern. 5% of adults reported experiencing psychological violence as children. 5%. That's a lot of people, yeah? And that's one too many. 44% reported experiencing physical violence inside sport as children and neglect, 37%, 35% reported experiencing non-contact sexual violence and 20% reported sexual violence. These are European data. We don't have the local data and it makes us uh, a bit afraid, right, to know what the numbers are like. So why is it important for us to define all these behaviours? It is important because when we see it, we need to report it. Then that allows us to respond and that allows us to achieve some kind of remediation. So that is the reason why we have developed a Safe Sport Unified Code because in different, different settings, sometimes things can differ. The interpretation, the definition can differ. What is acceptable in a swimming context versus a basketball context can differ. So we feel very strongly that there is a need to bring everyone together through a unified code, as you can see here. 
So it is important to recognize first and foremost because we know that there is a general lack of awareness amongst many people. So in our um, consultation, in our focus group discussion, in our surveys, we found that athletes shared that on hindsight, past incidents that they had witnessed within their environments were inappropriate behaviours which they should have stepped in to speak out against or reported, but did not. So that's a concern for us. Number one, because they lack awareness. They don't even know that it's wrong. Right? Secondly, if they know it's wrong, who do I report to? Or maybe I'm afraid to report to because I respect my coach, I respect the sports administrator, the sport leaders. Right? So this is what we're trying to do to create that uh, athletic environment that is respectful, equitable and free from non-accidental violence. And in order to do that, we need to look at what are the cultural contexts, and particularly in the context of sport, uh, and what does it mean as far as uh, this non-accidental violence is concerned. So if you look at the list that you see on the left here, it talks about many, many of these things are really a result of power differential. So if I'm a coach and I'm dealing with an athlete, there's a power differential. If you're an arts teacher and, and a, a, you're dealing with a student, there is that power differential, right? If I'm a leader, if I'm a principal, I'm working with uh, my teacher, there's a power differential. If, my, if I'm a captain in an athletic team and the other person is just a member, there is that power differential. So this can all lead to what you see here in terms of uh, what it can come out to in terms of violence, yeah? So that psychological, physical, sexual neglect. So these are some of the things that came out uh, in terms of us wanting to clearly define what these roles are and to achieve that commonality, that common definition. So the research suggests that the impacts are certainly profound and can be very long lasting. And that's something that we have to constantly remind ourselves that, and especially important that uh, we safeguard uh, those who are vulnerable people uh, and young persons. Yeah? So it can be emotional, it can be cognitive, mental, physical, relational, behavioral. These are all things that can have impact uh, on that person or the participant. So in the context of sport, and I can say it's the same would be for the arts or the music scene, in that it all starts with that trust. You take up a class, you join something, because you trust that you will be safe, right? You trust that you will be a, have a positive learning environment. Uh, so when there is a power imbalance, sometimes you don't you accept it as it is, right? This is how it is like. The teacher is like that in sport, uh, particularly in the martial arts. I always call my my coach the sensei, right? There's a lot of respect and a lot of trust there. But when it comes to that power imbalance, that's where. For certainly CYP stands for children and young persons, there is that deference to authority. For the vulnerable individuals or the VP of vulnerable persons, it's about dependence, right? And it's, it shows that children with disabilities are four times more likely to suffer abuse because of their dependence. So in sport, there's an emphasis on winning and sometimes an overemphasis on winning that leads to distrust, right? And finally, lack of oversight and capacity to be able to deal with cases that uh, is brought up or that are brought up. So when there is that trust, sometimes people tolerate what is going on. When there's tolerance, then it may be taken as permissible. Once it's permissible, it becomes normalization. It becomes disillusion, certainly for the affected parties. And that trust is no longer there or is broken, right? So the erosion of trust. Um, so, I think the environmental influence, uh, the environmental factors is something that we look at in our um, survey, in our unified code study. And these are the top three that we found. Fear of speaking up due to perceived consequences. Number two, the culture of tolerance and poor practice from leadership and management. And three, poor employment and volunteer screening. So this came off the survey and the focus group discussion. These are the top three reasons. Yeah. So maybe it applies to the art scene as well. All right. So, okay, let me, let me bring you to, oops, looks like I'm missing some slides here. Uh, yeah, here. So this was an 
uh, an effort that spanned over nine months, uh, a big effort on our part, to really find out what everyone thinks about safe sport, what we need to do to get better. And the court, unified court consultations, like I said, was over uh, nine months. We first started with uh, the experts, and you have uh, the police force, MOE, uh, KK Women's and Children's Hospital, MSF Children's Society, AWARE. So we consulted with the experts. Then we had focus, dis focus group discussion and survey, and it's involved 200 participants, 68 sporting organizations, eight stakeholder groups, and 57 sports. So quite an extensive sort of a consultation process that led to the development of the unified code that we now have. Right. And this is how we operate. We want to look at a trauma-informed approach. We want to look at prevention through policy and advocacy, assurance through training and education, and finally address through case management or proper case management. On the left here, when we deal with cases, there's always a support network that's needed, and we have now established a uh, network of qualified counsellors and befrienders who can be, uh, who can offer those support for the persons that are affected. So, I said earlier that we are all responsible. We all have a part part to play uh, in certainly ensuring that we safeguard um, sport, we safeguard arts, we space sport, music, and everything else. So, I think we need to remind ourselves not to be a bystander and to to act so that we can make a difference. Right, so that we can continue to safeguard uh, our own sectors. So with that, I, I thank you. And if you want to find out a lot more information about SafeSpot, feel free to um, scan the QR code and it will bring you to our website. And of course, you can contact me or you can contact us uh, if you want further information. Thank you. Thank you very much, Asha. I think that gives us a really valuable overview of some of the issues that emerge, but also some of the challenges that come up in trying to make sense of this terrain and find vocabularies that work as well as strategies that work. And we can talk in more detail later about some of the things that you've observed perhaps that come up in the process of trying to make this happen. Bernice, over to you. Thanks, Charlene. And thanks, Ashar, for that really impactful opening presentation. Um, and also many thanks to SDEA for this invitation and really for discussing this vital topic. Um, it feels urgent and it has been urgent for many years. Um, so it feels really good to be here. Um, hi, everyone. I'm Bernice, and I'm speaking today in my capacity as co-director of Roly Poly Family and co-founder of its parent company, Daring Do Dance. Fei Lim and I started the company together in 2018 as two artist friends. Um, in today's panel, I'll be speaking mainly about how we approach safety, as well as our body safety program, Body Smarts Through Movement Arts. The work we have done and continue to do to develop this program affects and informs all of our creative work, our teaching, our advising, and our mentoring. And within my sharing, um, just a heads up that there will be mentions of sexual abuse and child sexual abuse. Next slide. For us, it's vitally important that we do what we can to let children know that they are empowered, that they can speak up and communicate their needs in other ways, and that they will be listened to and taken seriously. As artists and teachers, we hold space for various emotions, including our own. Of course, we're also playful, silly, cheeky, you know, monkeys, artists, and teachers. But the effort to make sure that we create a truly caring and safe environment is always present in our work. And we do this also because we want children to know that they don't have to trust adults and people in power just by default. So we take a really active role in making sure that they know that we're working on this together, this sense of safety. And you know, we let them know that adults, in fact, especially the ones that are most trusted, we, we need to take an active role in looking out for their safety needs. And that where possible, we show children that their safety comes first. Um, we, we, we create a space where it's not just about speaking up. It is about speaking up, but it's also about us listening actively to different modes of communication and body language. 
Um, and this is especially um, for us as dance artists that the body might speak first. Um, and in some cases, the children may not be um, able to speak. In protecting children, the least we can do is our best to protect them at this very moment and at this time that they are with us. But what can we do now that can potentially help protect them in years to come? And while protection and safeguarding policies have an integral role in protecting children, the messages that we impart through our work and interactions with the children as artists and educators needs to be examined too. And in shaping our programs, we bring our perspectives as artists, educators, and parents. As artists, we provide an environment that makes children feel good, feel safe, so they can thrive creatively creatively and stay curious, we hold space for contradictions and for difficult and complicated feelings. As educators, we provide children, adults and organizations with the education, information, messages and assurances needed regarding safety and care. And as parents, we are considering the holistic and longer term view. What is this experience going to mean for the children and their families after the fact? What is this experience that we're bringing to them, whether it's a performance or a workshop? What's this going to be like for them in the years to come? In the next slide, I'd like to define body safety education. It's only one aspect of safeguarding children, but we see it as a very important ingredient as well. Body safety education aims to empower children with skills and knowledge that will increase their protection from child sexual abuse. In Roly Poly Family's work, at the same time that we work to empower children, we are also learning as adults about more comprehensive and more nuanced ways of protecting children in childhood. Um, I'll just share a really uh, early memory that was one of the impetuses behind this work, alongside all the images and articles that Azhar showed before. Um, since we started this in 2018, a lot of the issues that he brought up was top of mind. A very early memory that I have as a young dancer in primary school is of the dance teacher constantly caressing and cuddling a very cute child, super cute. I saw it quite frequently and the teacher would actively move the child, sit the child on their lap and touch their face a lot. And I felt very uncomfortable but never raised a question, never told anyone about it. I really hope there was no harm being done to that child but the behavior of that teacher constantly objectifying one child was really inappropriate regardless. And the fact that the memory and the discomfort stays with me till today is also a strong reminder of my own perceived helplessness as a child and also the kinds of memories that we as artists today and educators today want to leave behind with the children we work with. And in developing our work, we use experiences like the one I've just described to deeply consider our own responsibility as artists, educators, and dance teachers and really think about how we embody and practice what we're talking about. In the next slide. So after the 2017 resurgence of the Me Too movement, um, we saw a need to address boundaries and consent with people from a very young age. Faye especially was concerned by an emergence of CSA, child sexual abuse cases, where the children did not know they were being abused or that they could disclose abuse or feared the consequences of disclosure. Disclosure can facilitate harm reduction. Therefore, when we started our company in 2018, we knew that alongside the dance projects and dance teaching, we will also be developing a program for body safety and respect. And this became our Body Smarts Through Movement Arts program. Body Smarts focuses on CSA prevention, reducing harm and practicing respect. But what we learned from our training and research also clarified our broader understanding of how to work with children in caring ways that also allow them to be safe, to feel safe, and be able to take risks. In creating the program, we participated in training and, re and take resources from Singapore Children's Society. So we, oh, go back. We took the training kids live, I can protect myself. Um, and we kind of got to know the social service sector guide and child abuse um, reporting guide. Um, we did the training with AWARE, the Sexual Assault Awareness and First Responders Training. Um, Faye did a certificate in sex ed for people with developmental disabilities. And we refer to the Kid Power curriculum, which is, I think, based in the US. Um, and we, we did our own efficacy research about what, what kinds of information and content 
um, is useful for young children and, and how to, how to um, think about application in, in, in different age groups. Um, and we apply our skills and knowledge as dancers, um, particularly um, in our practice of contact improvisation, which is a movement practice. And we do also consent and boundary practice. And it's an ongoing thing um, that, you know, const constants requires kind of constant vigilance and, and, and sort of an ongoing awareness of how it's not ever so straightforward. And it's, it's been really enriching um, as a result. Um, to date, we have worked with a number of organizations to bring Body Smarts to primary school age children, to parents with preschool children, and last year we also ran training for our dance teachers and arts facilitators. Next slide. Um, one of the first things that we did as a small, small company, we worked on our child protection policy, and here's a little bit about that. Uh, we continue to evolve this document, and it's not static. Um, but there are four sort of broad categories. So in recruitment, we make sure we know the people, which seems really basic, but that doesn't always manage to happen, right? Because of the speed of work. Um, we work with the people over a long time and we have a buddy system with them. So most of the, t and, and then also most of the time in our programs, there are other chaperones or caregivers anyway. So we rarely have just one teacher facing a whole group of students. Um, we do education and training, so we do training for artists already working with us, and we have opened the training up to folks who are interested in joining um, the way that we work. We do communications uh, in the sense that we make sure that um, parents, families are aware of our, our caution when we deal with image use, especially in this day and age. Um, so, but other than you know just checking the boxes about privacy and that consent is given from families, and also from the children when they can, we also ensure that the image itself is safe to use and not easily abused, not easily replicated if children are in the image. So we don't have any frontal or close-up images. Um, we're very aware of the gaze that we're inviting to the pictures and we're mindful of the captions. In other words, we're incredibly vigilant, especially with images. Um, next slide, please. So other than dealing head on with this issue um, through our Body Smarts program and reaching as many families and children as we can, um, we also just keep an eye on the emotional illiteracy in our programs. Um, the way that we talk to people, um, we try our best to uh, make space for nuance and we try our best to also um, kind of pay attention to the different emotions in the room at the same time, right? Uh, we do a risk assessment of the messaging in our work and the way that we represent children. Um, so for example, we did dancing in place in the height of the pandemic in 2020. And um, we were really thinking through how to work on video and on camera and on Zoom um, with children under the age of 13 um, and thinking about how they might be represented and you know these images that will get shown in a film that we get to keep and get to call our intellectual property. So we were thinking a lot about how we divide up the, um, the sort of artistic representation and uh, the way that we talk about the work and in terms of the way that we talk about the ownership of the work. Um, so, so that work is called Dancing in Place and there's like a Facebook thing that you can look at um, and, some, and we might rescreen it at some point. Um, we practice active listening to children's perspectives, and we also do our own small form of advocacy. Um, for example, we've done training for collaborators, and we've worked, uh, Faye has worked recently with Chong Gwaki um, in the Seedlings program at the Esplanade, uh, working with children and mentoring them through a process of creation. Um, we, cons we do consulting for organizations and schools, and sometimes we also make social media posts on topical issues and news about CSA. So for example, there was a really recent case in the news about a dance instructor uh, abusing children, and we made a response um, that we hope will inform other teachers and parents as well to think about, think about this issue in, in, in a very in-depth manner. 
So finally, we're just really glad that SDA is opening up conversation about this, especially for artists and educators. Um, we, we understand that the social service sector and the education sector has its own work done, and of course, Safe Spot has done its own work. Um, but there are you know, lots of things that we can really develop together. Um, and it was really exciting to us when, when the Safe Spot SG document came up because it was so comprehensive and the plans are really solid. Um, and we hope that by modeling some ways of care, safety, agency in the way that we work, we um, kind of show that, that there are ways that we all actively participate in this work. And I see a lot of people nodding, right? And, and it is a lot of effort, it's constant effort to make sure that we undo the things that we might have been taught. Um, we're also members of Citrus Practices, shout out to them, um, who are looking into care practices in the arts workplace. And there are lots of intersecting conversations about these topics in the arts. And so it's not just for children, it's just, you know, how do we take care of, of ourselves and be able to speak up ourselves, you know, by modeling, you know, this, these kinds of behaviors of disclosure, which is never easy. So imagine that for children. Um, yeah, and it's an evolving and responsive practice and we continue to examine this and we're glad that this panel is a space for that. So finally, just thank you and you can see, uh, maybe it's a bit faint, the email address over there, you can reach us there. Um, and our website is undergoing some changes but um, all the information will be there and a lot of our content is on Instagram including the posts about uh, the child sexual abuse. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you. Um, thank you very much, Bernice, for reminding us that really the challenge is to be able to enable children or the young people to know how to do this and how to be participant in this process, right? Uh, which involves that vigilance and listening and continuing to develop literacies and question the gaze, I think, especially in the arts, yeah. <laughs> uh, who, who owns the work and how does that work get used and framed and positioned becomes really uh, a question of the ethics of ownership that needs to be looked at. Thank you very much. We'll talk more further. Deborah, over to you. Hi, uh, and uh, thank you to SDA for the invitation for having me. And thank you to my fellow panelists as well, Asa and Bernice. Uh, I think we've been learning from you uh, through the resources that you posted online and also through your presentations just now, so thanks so much. Um, my name is Deborah. I'm from Zion Bishan Bible Presbyterian Church. I'm a member of the safeguarding team there. Uh, and just to start with, this is actually the first thing that the, f the first slide. This is actually the first thing that people see. If we go back to the first one, when uh, we talk about, we started talking about safeguarding in our church, uh, to emphasize that we're a community with a collective responsibility to care uh, for young and vulnerable. I just want to mention my team members on the next slide. Uh, we're a small team at the moment, a team of three, uh, but yeah, really grateful for their partnership in, uh, in this endeavor in going through this. Okay, so I was asked to share about how, uh, really why and how we got started. Uh, with safeguarding. Uh, so, I mean, just to, again, just to bring us back to what we are talking about when we talk about safeguarding uh, in Zion Bishan, uh, is to safeguard and care for the well-being of all in the church, especially the young and vulnerable, uh, who are less able to protect themselves, uh, is to cultivate a safe environment where all are responsible to guard against the risks and effects of abuse. Uh, it is to respond swiftly and effectively if there should be a safeguarding breach or any instance or allegation of abuse. Um, and then also in their response is providing compassion and spiritual support for any victims of abuse and also um, if we know of anyone who has committed abuse to hold them accountable and see them commit to change and to live transformed lives. Okay, next. Okay, so yeah, we were asked to um, talk a bit about how we got started and why. Uh, we, we, this is a question that we get a lot. Um, and so essentially, in we, uh, as a church, we do a lot of pastoral care work. You know, our members come to us with, uh, come to leaders and pastors with issues and concerns of all kinds. And we, uh, our pastors did encounter allegations or instances of abuse and misconduct that were raised by the, uh, by the attendees and members. And alongside that, uh, around the same time, starting from a few years ago, 
there were many highly publicized cases of abuse, both locally and globally. I mean, it was impossible to ignore, you know, the Larry Nessa case being one very notorious example. Uh, the Me Too movement that prompted a lot of uh, really an outpouring uh, of, of these instances that had happened. Um, so we, these were both local and global. They were in religious context, non-religious context, big organizations, small organizations, no organizations, right? Um, and so we noticed the prevalence of abuse that it can and does happen in all kinds of settings. And the cases that we, uh, you know, these very public cases that were highlighted, and, you know, it, it prompted a lot of thinking, could this kind of thing happen here? Uh, you know, are we vulnerable to this kind of thing happening as well? And as we looked into this, we realized that this is a complex area. Uh, there are many things to think about, uh, people to care for. Um, and so, yeah, we needed guidance really to protect the vulnerable, respond well to any uh, safety concerns and care for those in need of help or support. Okay, so we embarked on a process of learning. Uh, I think what one thing that was very uh, valuable uh, was really listening to victims and survivors that we knew personally. Uh, there was so much to learn from them. We were so privileged to hear their stories and receive uh, their stories. Um, and uh, we also carried out research on other organizations' safeguarding policies and processes, and we tried to glean what are the best practices. Uh, safeguarding uh, children in religious organizations and other organizations is an area that we found was uh, further along in development in places such as the UK, Australia, and some parts of the States. Uh, so we tried to look at those and see uh, what they were doing and what were the common threads that we could pick out. Um, we also sought input from others who had experience in safeguarding and child protection, uh, including uh, people such as social workers and counsellors uh, in our membership, people that we knew personally, uh, and they were most happy to give input when they, they uh, understood what we were trying to do. Uh, we also continued to follow, unfortunately, that you know the cases of abuse uh, that were very public and very prominent, they, you know, they kept being reported. And so we continued to follow those to see what we could learn, right? Uh, and then lastly, we also sought out training as much as we could find. Uh, there is, yes. Okay, okay, I'm so sorry. <laughs> I will try and slow down a bit. Okay, we also uh, tried to find uh, resources for training. Uh, so, uh, there was frankly not a lot of specialized safeguarding training uh, that we could find, uh, but we 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 went to uh, we went to, uh, to attend what we could. So one was um, actually mentioned by uh, Bernice earlier, the sexual assault first responders training uh, offered by Aware. That was a great resource uh, to learn from uh, in terms of how to care for victims well, how to respond well, and then also uh, we looked for resources that uh, were. Um, aimed at churches because we were looking for things that could work for our context and one conference that we went for I mean was called church as a refuge and that was really you know that's really what we want uh, what we wanted to see the church as a safe place and uh, also there's a uh, uh, body safety training which I'll touch on again later okay next please okay so with that we started to develop really first our a uh, statement of principles uh, and values, uh, explaining what safeguarding is, why it is needed, uh, and to set out the church's priorities that will guide our policies and responses. And this is really because we recognize that um, there was not a lot of awareness about this, so we needed to explain how it was grounded in our convictions as Christians, you know, to care for the vulnerable among us. And so uh, some of these uh, statements now are captured in our safeguarding policy, which is uh, on our website, and I think the link was given to everyone for pre-event reading. Yeah, so we started based on principle. And then one of the first resources, and one that we're still using today, uh, was really to seek to empower children uh, through uh, helping uh, to provide body safety education. And so what we use and what we invite uh, parents and preschoolers to attend in our church is Kids Life uh, by Singapore Children's Society, and it helps children protect themselves against sexual abuse. Uh, recognize when they're in an unsafe situation uh, and seek help. And one thing about this is that the parents attend as well, so they can see and they can understand what's being taught. And it also helps them, I think, continue this conversation with their children. I attended with my daughter and I found it very useful as well. Yeah. 
Okay, so with that, we were able to create some basic training. Uh, and it was, it's uh, really with the aim of raising awareness at this stage. Uh, is this an internal thing that we do for our leaders and volunteers? You know, so we start with uh, explaining the principles and values and underlining the importance of why we are doing this. Uh, and then abuse awareness, uh, just talking about what, what forms abuse can take, what it can look like, what are some signs that we might notice. Um, and then introducing the idea of safe behaviours or practices, right? the idea of safe or unsafe touch, what are some things to avoid, what are some things that should be encouraged to model healthy relationships to our children who are also watching us. Um, we, they also have guidance on how to receive and report a disclosure internally uh, within the organisation, as well as uh, signposting to community resources such as helplines. You know, for if perhaps they're in a situation where they feel like the church is not involved, they're concerned about a neighbour or something, you know, we still want to um, offer the help that we have uh, and the resources that we've learned about from our training. Um, but really beyond specific do's and don'ts, we're seeking to build what we call safety mindset, a culture of looking out for one another. And we also emphasise the community effort because this uh, goes out to quite a lot of leaders and uh, lay people, a lot of whom are volunteers. So we do not want to feel individuals to feel unduly burdened about all this, but we want them to uh, feel supported, yeah, even in seeking to play their part in this. Okay. Okay, and I think the last thing I want to mention is uh, really the wider organizational culture. Uh, I think within the whole membership of the church and people who come and attend with us regularly, uh, we have sought to raise awareness uh, by putting up a safeguarding info page uh, on our church website where we talk about uh, our views on safeguarding. Uh, we, we link to some of our policies so people can see uh, you know, what, the, what is in place. We also link to resources for help, so it's like a repository of useful information. Uh, we've also been uh, talking about these issues from time to time. Uh, our pastors may mention it during services, or we write about our work in the church bulletin, which is like a weekly update to members. So from time to time, there'll be, um, you know, these sorts of things uh, that members can take note of and be informed. Uh, and really, I think, uh, this safeguarding effort has kind of come together with uh, general efforts, I think, in the church to uh, be a safe space where people can be honest and open about any concerns or issues they are facing, uh, even difficult issues. So, for example, we had a conversation on mental health. Uh, and, uh, yeah, so we are trying to uh, build a culture generally where people feel safe to speak up about any kind of concern that they have. And I think the flip side of that is the last point that leaders or anyone that they come to for help uh, must receive that, that information well, right? must be open to feedback, uh, must be quick to listen really, and not uh, quick to be defensive or react negatively. Yeah, so, uh, so yes, that's what we've been seeking to do, and thanks so much for listening. Thank you very much, Deborah. Um, I think it's always good to be reminded, although it's an unpleasant feeling, that some of the spaces we think are safest are not. And uh, some of the people that should be the most trustworthy are not, and therefore to recognize that this kind of literacy is unpleasant, it creates discomfort, but nonetheless, one has to learn from within. And uh, sadly, religious places have become targets also of that kind of scrutiny in a good way, but also sometimes um, negatively as well. Uh, we have a couple of questions already on Slido, and I want to encourage people online to continue sending them. We will get to them. But um, thank you all again for, for the very rich presentations that come out of your own connection with this work and your involvement and motivation to, to take it on. And I would like to ask if you could say a little bit about your observations about what's really challenging about taking it on? What becomes uh, an area that you find, you know, is a dilemma, is a difficult thing to navigate and negotiate, becomes a challenge in that way, or it's a resistance, as it were? And what are some of the rewards of taking it on? We don't want it to be all bleak, but, you know, what are some of the changes that you see, positive changes that do come when there is literacy? and when there is awareness, and then when there is a community effort as well, right? It's not just a solo individual having to be a warrior, so to speak. 
So if you could say a little bit about what some of these challenges and some of these rewards are to give us an insight into what it's like to be involved in the work itself. Asha, I'm going to start with you. I thought it's ladies first. <laughs> <laughs> but happy to start. Uh, yeah, that, that's really a good question. And maybe I start with the positives first and then come to the challenges. Um, so I think what we're certainly happy about is when we started in 2018, there were examples that we can follow because uh, the movement in it, uh, started by the IOC in 2016. So by the time we got on board, there were already a lot of resources available. And uh, there was the US Center for Seasport that has been established. So we were fortunate in that sense that when we went out there to do our literature work, uh, research and review, we found good articles and we had friends from overseas, US Centers of Seasport, um, Coaching Association in Canada, who were really, really willing to share resources with us to help build our own resources and con to contextualize, very importantly, right? Contextualize to, to the Singapore context, the environment, the landscape and ecosystem. So that has been very useful for us uh, and that has certainly led to where we are right now, where we have established last year in November that unified safe sport. Uh, people were willing to come forward because they, they are aligned to our cause and what we're trying to do. So we couldn't have done it if uh, we didn't get that kind of a support from, from people. Uh, but I guess they are supportive because of what they are seeing around them. Um, and you know, you reflected from in the past about your own <laughs> experiences, uh, looking at somebody being a little bit too intimate with a child uh, or behaving in a not the most appropriate way, right? So I think we've had a similar group of people who have experienced that and then therefore have come forward to help us be a lot more informed. Uh, the other group is certainly the vulnerable groups, the people with vulnerabilities. Uh, so it has been really enlightening to hear from them. And when you hear, you, you just sit back and say, wow, I, I never realized that there are all these challenges that these people face. So I think all in all, uh, and that's why it took us so long, right? Nine, nine months worth of uh, consultation and talking to people and uh, you know experts and so on. Um, but the challenge continues to be from groups, organization, people that have never experienced this and say to us that, no, we're fine. There's never been any cases in our uh, you know, organization. We are good. You know, but actually they are not, right? I mean, I, I, I showed earlier about uh, that iceberg, right? Yeah. So maybe the tip of the iceberg is nothing for them because nothing has been reported, but that doesn't mean that yeah. nothing has ever happened, right? Uh, and unfortunately, we are seeing that as well. We are seeing a rise in the number of cases reported to us. So we look at it uh, positively in the sense that perhaps, or we like to believe that there is now greater awareness and that's why people are reporting these cases, right? They recognize that, oh, maybe this was what was acceptable in the past, but it's no longer is, so I want to report it. So we look at the increased numbers as a positive that way. Uh, secondly is, we also believe that people are now reporting because they have the confidence that their reports or their disclosures will be dealt with uh, fairly, right? And with confidentiality as well. So those are some of the things that we're happy about um, in terms of what we've achieved as well as some of the challenges that we continue to face. Thank you. I think uh, willful ignorance is one of the most difficult <laughs> things to deal with. In That's life, right. Right. Yeah. Thank you. Bernice, if you could tell us about your um, thoughts. Sorry. Um, I think one of the main challenges is feeling a bit like the paranoid android, you know? like. Once you have that lens on and you see things knowing the extreme cases or what, what could go badly wrong, I think that's kind of challenging and trying to think about, trying to talk to people who might be willfully ignorant, right? I think a lot of times people come from a place of, no, actually I want to trust the, the world. I want my children to trust the world yeah. and, and that's important to us too. Yeah. Right, and and we we really try to make sure that in our our workshops and the way that we do this work, there's an assurance that the goal is affection and trust and respect. Um, 
but also just kind of awareness of what else is out there, right? And and I think that that lens has been quite challenging to navigate. Like when 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 is it? When am I just really just being too paranoid, right? And thinking about this too much? And when is it that yeah, actually it is good to, for instance. Um, I, my favorite example would be saying to camera people, hi, <laughs> like camera people, like, hey, did you um, ask for consent, right? And I, I think that's, that's not really part of the way that people behind the lenses have been working. Um, and that's not like on them. It's just the way that we're so used to cameras being everywhere. And that's the other aspect that we're really interested in, in terms of digital safety for children, especially in Singapore, because um, I think the, there's an institute that I can't remember the name of that started doing some research about digital safety. I think it's tied to Singtel. Um, there's a re there's an institute, um, and they you know Singapore children get phones from a really young age, and not all parents know how to protect them. Mm. Yeah, and these things follow them to their beds. Yeah. Some of the rewards of doing <laughs> the work and. <laughs> You know, being involved in that kind of constant negotiation you talked mm -hmm. about, it's never really completely settled. You're just continually having to figure it out. I think I got better personally at articulating and thinking through my own boundaries, mm -hmm. which I think is not that easy when you're an artist. Like, you're like, oh, I just want to make work, right? Yeah. But, but I think I got better at that and thinking ahead a bit more. Um, so that's personal. Um, but in terms of just really actively participating in this world, it's that actually there are a lot of people out there who are really keen on the work and thinking through the implications, right? Personal implications of it. Thank you. So again, a reminder that there are people out there willing to support the work, not just locally, as you pointed out, Asa, but internationally, willing to share resources, and that becomes something important to remember. So you don't feel you're on your own, so to speak, yeah? Deborah? Um, okay, I guess challenges first. Uh, I think I can relate a lot to what uh, Azar and Bernice said. Uh, but maybe I'll just pick up one thing uh, that I thought of as well, and that is that it can feel very heavy, uh, you know, having to think about this and all the horrible things that could happen and have happened, right? Uh, in, uh, in you see a reported case and you think, could that happen? What can we do? How can we make things better? Uh, and thinking about that stuff all the time is, you know, it, it's very draining. And I saw that's why I think it's been uh, important to have partnership in this, to not sort of, you know, task one person to go and come up with a safeguarding framework and all that, but really to uh, have a team and be able to support one another. Uh, and that actually also brings me to the reward of, yeah, this of safeguarding is uh, doing this work, uh, is, yeah, being able to sort of journey together with the rest of the safeguarding team. Uh, seeing also other organizations, other sectors, seeing what uh, people are doing in, uh, in coming up with resources, in being so willing to share them, uh, even in doing something like this where uh, trying to get some, you know, trying to learn more and get something started, that's always really encouraging to see, you know, and I think it can only be good really for the common good and for our young ones, you know, as they do uh, all these things in different areas of their lives, we play sports, uh, arts, uh, religious activities and so on, yeah. And in your view, some of the rewards, those, those sort of highlights <laughs> for you? Yeah, uh, yeah, so, uh, yeah, I mean, I think that, that really is it, you know, seeing uh, society, I think, or different sectors of society really make progress on this, yeah. Thank you. Um, I'm going to take some of the questions that are coming up on Slido. Some of them overlap, but basically people are asking, uh, what are some initial steps people can take, right? Starting points, sort of uh, protocols or immediate responses that you would recommend for arts practitioners to try and employ in our practice um, so that I guess people feel, okay, there are all these resources, there are all these policy documents and guidelines, but let's say we just need something now because in half an hour I'm going to run a workshop and I need to have some kind of shift in my head, maybe. What are some key points that you think people need to just take on immediately? No need to think about it already. It's sort of almost as if you, you know, you can do this in the next half hour um, because it's urgent, I guess. It's immediate. It's, 
it's time to get on with it. Yes, I'm asking a difficult question. That's my job. You're asking about arts, so... Uh, I'm asking about the arts, but I guess it's about <laughs> safety across yeah. the board, right? So, and which would be applicable to the arts as well. So yeah, so if you're talking about, you know, quick access to information and resources, you want it now, uh, you want to roll out something, you want to run a workshop, then uh, we are certainly most happy to share whatever we have. Um, I, I didn't quite go into that, but in one of my slides, I did share that, uh, that it, the importance of awareness, and we do that through education and training. So we have an online suite of SafeSpot module. That's about an hour and a half, uh, an hour and a half long. And we have it for athletes, we have it for parents, we have it for a version for athletes, for parents, for coaches, uh, for sport administrators, and they're all free. Well, there you go. <laughs> so that's the catch. Happy word, to right? share, uh, you know, those. And I, I think whilst it is in a sporting context, there are certainly similarities. Uh, I mean, we talk about um, good touch and bad touch, right? So what does it look like in, in sporting context when I'm trying to manipulate the limbs so that I'm teaching a particular technique? So I, I say that will be applicable to dance. Right, or applicable to uh, anything for that matter where there is a need to, yeah, music, where there is a need to touch. And our coaches have never been educated that, you know, you should be asking for permission. You should not be touching direct, directly, you know, onto your athletes. Uh, there are generally acceptable parts of the body where this is a no-no and this is okay. So it's about that body skills, uh, body safety awareness and body safety skills that I think you guys are also educating certainly in your program, right? Uh, so, so I think that is something that is across the board and it can be applicable not just in the sporting context but in other contexts as well. So I think the resources, we're happy, more than happy to, to share those with anybody who's interested. Thank you for that offer. Yeah. You'll find some people might take you up on sure. it. As <laughs> as. Thoughts, Deborah, Bernice, about starting points, you know, immediate protocols and references that people should take on? Um. I think, okay, I was looking at the pre-event reading uh, and I was uh, happy to see the NSPCC UK website, uh, which is really comprehensive uh, and it talks about child protection generally and I saw that they have a page for the arts, so you might want to look there. Um, we, for the church, we have also put, uh, you know, whatever resources that we think will be helpful for members uh, on our website. It is for our church context, but if any of that uh, is helpful, you know, you're welcome to look at it. Um, and I think, you know, just in, in terms of maybe if, if you take your example of the workshop, you know, what do I need to do? I think uh, one principle we always try to talk about in, when we talk about safe behaviours and practices is practising transparency, right? Uh, do the child's parents know where they are? Do you have consent? Uh, do, do they know what's going to happen in the class? Uh, are there enough adults around? Uh, is your space open? Is it isolated? Is it secluded? You know, that kind of thing. Um, and I think being transparent also, uh, you can think about being honest with ourselves, right? Keeping ourselves accountable. This is something that uh, as an adult or as the person, the responsible person, uh, is this something that, uh, that I, would, I would do, you know, if, uh, if someone is watching me, right? Just having that personal integrity as well. So yeah, those are all things you could start thinking about at least. Thank you. Bernice, any thoughts? Um, we have that list, right? Kids Life, Sexual Assault First Responders Training by Aware, Safe Sport, um, our, our Body Smarts programs. We're going to move some online as well. Um, but I think in that 30 minutes, like the best thing I can do for myself is to take care of my emotional well-being. So it could be just like making sure I declutter, like... Do, do some breathing if you do like meditation or stretching or something. That's, that's usually helpful to slow your own reactivity down um, because sometimes things happen and then like our fight or flight kicks in and that's not always the best response. Mm. Yeah. I like that. Take, take a, it's like take a stop yourself. take of oneself in yeah. a way that before you start looking everywhere for what to do, look at what's within. Are there any questions or comments from the floor here? Do you want to raise your hand and uh, a mic will get passed to you because we're recording this? Not yet? 
Okay, think about it and, and perhaps in a while. Uh, let me ask another question that has come up. And that is uh, this question about how should practitioners, educators, parents, and so on, introduce, educate the children. You know, how do we educate the kids or even youth uh, about this terrain and about reporting such incidents, since this is the focus in this session on children. Uh, perhaps what are the kinds of vocabularies or what are the kinds of frameworks in which you think this work can be done effectively to address what you're saying about cultures of fear and reluctance and authority that uh, seem to prevail despite these various stories that have come up in the headlines, right? So it's shifted in some terrains, but it hasn't shifted in other terrains. Uh, and sometimes the organizations that are unwilling to change is the home organization, right? And, and what's happened for generations is good enough for me and my kids sort of thing, right? So how does one approach that so that young people get access to what we're talking about and trying to do? What you're talking about and trying to do? I think if you look at the cases that has happened in Singapore, uh, often that happens in the home or that happens with the people that are closest uh, to the victims. So, so that's something that we, we need to you know, recognize and be aware of. Um, about a month and a half ago, there was a report about uh, MOE and uh, ECDA or Early Childhood Development Agency um, strengthening the framework that they have uh, and they're starting to train uh, using a revised curriculum uh, preschool teachers um, in terms of the body safety skills that they introduce to kids. So we, we, we read that article and we were quick to jump uh, onto that opportunity and we contacted uh, NIEC, uh, National Institute of Early Childhood Education. Uh, we contacted MOE and quickly told them that we would like to be a part of that, right? Because they are raising this awareness or raising the importance of uh, you know, these body skills, what is good touch, what is bad touch, even at the preschool level. So I think that's a really huge step forward in terms of educating uh, kids, children, the most vulnerable, right? at the very young age, at the preschool level, what it means. Um, and to present to them, I like to think, to present to them in a language that they can understand. Uh, so we, we, we jumped on board and I sent out emails to them and we invited them to a Singapore Children's Society Kids Life uh, event recently workshop that we co uh, you know, presented. Um, and, and again, it's heartening to know that they said, okay, let's, let's do this together. You know? Because uh, our concern is when you're teaching kids about these body safety skills and what is good touch and bad touch in a general education setting, or in a general setting, will look different in a sports setting where I'm in my swimming suit and it is acceptable for the coach to touch me because the coach is trying to get me to be able to swim. So what is good touch and what is bad touch in that context? So we wanted to insert some of those in the teaching of the kids, in the teaching of the preschool teachers. So I'm, I'm happy to say that they were positive about it and uh, we're working closely with them now. Thank you. Thoughts on working with the kids? I mean, I know you talked about bringing the parents in as well and involving not just one sector, but you know, it becomes intersectional in that sense. And I think that's something you're raising as well, Bernice. Thoughts about how to work with the kids? Um, I think the thing that we realize is that the messaging needs to be underpinned by truly respecting children's body autonomy. Right. And also for children to understand that they own their bodies. That's not always obvious, um, especially in our culture where, where I think there's a pretty, it's great, it's a pretty collectivist mindset. Right. But for children, sometimes they can be confused that, you know, their, their bodies, yes. Sometimes it's, sometimes children will, come, will be in our workshop and they'll be like, uh, my body belongs to my mother or my father. Right. Yeah. And, and, you know, that, that's, that's just the way their minds work and just making sure that that's clear to them and then giving, the, giving them agency and paying attention to what they have to say on a day-to-day -day basis. Of course, there are limits on that, but if we're clear about what those limits are and we hold those limits well, I think we do, we do a pretty good job. Yeah, so can I just 
dwell on that word agency a little bit, right? So when you say you're giving them agency, it doesn't mean they can do anything they want. Yeah. Right. So just clarify what you mean by that so that, you know, one is not just using this word lightly, but it's kind of, there's a consciousness about it. So I think one of the things that we really, that we really uh, use is the Respectful Infant Educarer Framework by Magda Gerber. And it's basically this idea that children are born into the world knowing and conscious and active participants who can collaborate from birth, right? So if we, when we wear that lens looking at children, I think it means that we see that they are not objects. And I think the agency, seeing that agency is from that. <laughs> I'm not sure I can articulate it very well right now, but has to do with um, them being active participants in their own lives. Yeah. Can, can I jump in? <laughs> um, the, the agency is an important one, uh, and, and that's what we are hoping to achieve by way of educating the entire community, you know, uh, and that's why we have that sweet LC sport module for, for athletes, for parents, for coaches, for sport administrators, so that we elevate the level of awareness uh, amongst everybody in the sporting community to the extent that if I'm an athlete and I see something wrong and I relate to your, the, the, the incident you mentioned, right? The child is the one having, experiencing that power differential between him or her and let's say the, the teacher or let's say the coach. I'm an outsider, I'm another child. I see that because I'm educated on say sport, I will be able to tell that this is wrong and because I got no power differential between me and that coach, I will report it. Right? And then seated over there is another coach looking at this coach, uh, you know, doing something inappropriate. That coach can walk over and also exercise therefore his agency and say something to this coach, right? Over there, there's a parent who has gone through our module and they are also educated and they will make a report because uh, you know, they know where to report our email and, and our uh, number and all that. So that's how we envision um, the effect when we truly educate everyone on say sport. Um, yeah, so that will be how... And that's like what it means when we say it takes a village to raise a child. Yeah, right? exactly. It's not yeah. a village that's yeah. going to sit by and yeah. watch the child get abused. It's yeah. a village that's willing to take action mm -hmm. when something like this happens. Yeah, yeah. that's right. Thank you for that. Anything to add, Deborah? Um, yeah, I mean, when you ask a question, I mean, I thought about how, you know, parents are invited to participate in the body safety training with their children. Uh, and I think, uh, yeah, that's really important to kind of get uh, adults, maybe those are different generations for whom this may be a totally new thing, uh, to sort of be exposed to these ideas and to understand where we're coming from. You know, and why is like you know why I can't just you know pick up you know uh, touch a child the way I I was accustomed to, or maybe the way I was touched as a child, right? Uh, what was wrong with that? You know, so all that all that needs to be kind of explained, I think. Yeah. So I mean, it is good to see this kind of spreading across sectors and organizations. Yeah, for general awareness. Yeah. Thank you. Anyone in the floor who would like? Yes, Tabitha. Uh, so I actually have a question from Kamini, so she just texted me because it's quite long. Uh, we actually want to find out about digital safeguarding and what are some developments in Singapore in this area. So we're actually asking about online live stream performances or workshop or classes between an adult and a child. Uh, what are existing frameworks to help teaching artists to be more mindful about safeguarding? Hmm. Um. <laughs> I don't know about frameworks, uh, but the way that we practice it, some examples would be checking with the children before, you know, recording, which people do now for Zoom, um, telling them what we're recording for. Uh, so we do the consent stuff with the parents, but we also do it verbally with the children, so they are aware. Um, things like pointing out, you know, in a non-shaming or non-like, oh, scared way, like about the angles of their cameras, you know, pointing certain things out and just be like, oh, okay, why don't you fix it? And it's just, 
it's a non-event, but just be helping them be mindful of the angle of the camera as well. Uh, those are two I can think of. Yeah, I was going to ask someone from SDA if they would like to respond. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just going to add to what Bernice said, not as a member of SDA now, but as a parent. Because my daughter was part of Dancing in Place as well as Seedlings. And there were a few things that I observed and I felt very safe that my daughter was in front of this laptop with someone from Sydney. I don't know. I, know I, I wasn't very involved in it. But they made us as parents feel safe as well. So I was very grateful for that. Uh, something as simple as plicking, picking the right platform um, for the children to communicate. Like uh, for Dancing in Place, the children in Singapore had to communicate with children in Sydney. Uh, it was across time zones, across uh, you know, spaces and all that. And uh, they decided after doing some research that WhatsApp was not the best platform, mm -hmm. uh, wasn't the safest platform. So something as simple as that. I think we used Line. Some, no. some platform. Something I've seen deleted. Yeah. <laughs> so. so a safer platform. And then I realized that uh, even that small little change gave me confidence as a parent to allow my child to engage um, with other people online uh, because I know that they've put some thought into it. Um, the group chats that were created were moderated by them. Um, and they always made a conscious effort to check in with the children as well. I mean, the parents signed the, the declaration form and this form and that form. But the children also had an active voice in what they wanted to use. Um, they asked for permission. Can we say this? Can we include this in the video? Can we you know, use your drawing? Is it OK for us to do this? And I think that was very important. Uh, throughout the, the entire journey. It, it reflected their practice or their, their you know, safe practices were, were very visible throughout everything that they did in those two projects. So yes, I that's what I wanted to say. Thanks, <laughs> Thank <Asha>. you. <laughs> yeah, so there are many, many aspects to it, right? The, the technology is one thing, but then the, the culture and the context is another thing. And then, of course, the individual situations. I mean, there's the, the so much involved. Um, and this is combining a few questions. So one is, how do we get over or get beyond this uh, reluctance to do anything about it, right? Whether it's willful ignorance or just inertia, lack of understanding of the urgency. And what do you do when something actually goes wrong, when something is breached within the organization, within the workshop, within the sport scene, as it were, and then you have to take action and do something uh, which can be seen as a kind of learning moment in a way, apart from the responsibility to make sure that there's accountability and the child or whoever is you know, uh, a victim is then looked after in that sense. Um, how do you actually go about doing something about it and what sorts of you know, action be becomes effective rather than just tokenistic for the sake of, you know, which happens sometimes, right? Something is done just to show that something is done rather than action that's really going to make a difference. In one of the slides that I shared earlier, I, and that was really came off the back of the survey and the focus group discussion that we had with uh, so many people. The number one uh, reason why uh, our problem yeah. is the fear of speaking up, right? So I think that's a, that's a real problem that we need to address, uh, the biggest challenge. Uh, and it has to start, therefore, with, in our view, uh, that education and awareness um, to know that, first, this is wrong. Because if they don't know that it is wrong, then they will never report it, right? Because, yeah, it's, it's, yeah <laughs> that's acceptable. And what we're finding, from certainly from our coaches and, and others as well, parents included, is some of them, when they, f when they learn about this, they realize that, oh, I didn't know that this is a problem. I didn't know that this is inappropriate all along. You know, I thought this was fine. So we saw that the coaches are now having to ask themselves and challenging the practices of the past and to, to find out whether or to, to ask themselves whether this is still appropriate, you know, given these uh, current times. Um, we have a, an acronym that we use. Uh, if anybody were to bring it up to us, let's say somebody recognizes that, oh, there's a problem there um, and reports to us, 
if we are trained, then we use the TLC. So we know TLC as standard loving care, right? But in Safe Sport, we use TLC differently. So T, T is treat all cases as uh, real, as authentic, as genuine, and therefore you take it seriously. So if somebody comes up to me, or a child comes up to me and say, you know, I observe something, or something happens to me, then the first response shouldn't be, should never be, are you sure? You know, then automatically you get closed off. I'm not going to tell you anything else because you don't believe me. So the T is very important. Uh, and then L is listening carefully, right? Listening uh, with, with care uh, and concern. So then that will, that will be when we are able to, oh, okay, understand a little bit more. And then finally, um, uh, listen calmly, uh, uh, listen with care and concern, and then see is uh, that care, the comfort that we offer to this uh, individual. Uh, so that's the TLC. Uh, the other one is really around telling our coaches, our sport administrators about the rule of two. And that will apply also in the digital space, right? So you we will never have a, uh, a, a coaching session where it's just the coach and the athletes and nobody else. So we have that rule of two. There must be another uh, athlete or another uh, adult or another trained person. So, uh, and you know, things like offering a lift to somebody. In the past, we say, that's yes, fine, uh, I'm offering a lift. I'm just being nice, <laughs> I offer a lift uh, to my student to send them home. But now it's no, no. You know, that rule of two still applies in those contexts as well. Yeah. Thank you, that's really practical on the one level and I like the TLC acronym, uh, the most important being treat every case as genuine to begin with so that there is that initial reckoning of respect and trust. Yeah, yeah. Other thoughts on that as first steps or? You had a question on, I, I think initial, how to overcome the inertia of getting things going, is it? There's, that's one. That's so one. one is the culture of tolerance and the yeah. other is that, yeah. Uh, and then the other one was a, in responding to a case. Okay. Uh, I mean, I can answer the, the one about resp response. Uh, I think when Asa shared about TLC, uh, we have an acronym that we use in our training, which is SAFE. <laughs> this is so but Singapore, right? Yeah, it's all about acronyms. We love all the acronyms. Right? <laughs> all acronyms. Yeah, but very similar ideas about listening, taking cases seriously, listening... Uh, very attentively and being sort of slower to speak and quicker to listen and take in what the child is saying uh, and then assuring them that they're doing the right thing by telling you. Uh, and then for, uh, you know, our volunteers, we say, you know, find help. F is for find help. You know, don't try and deal with it alone. You know, yeah. escalate it internally. Uh, and then E is actually to ensure their own well-being because they may feel very burdened by this, this thing that has been shared with them, depending what it is. Uh, yeah, so I mean, this is uh, basically to encourage uh, people to surface things that concern them. And we say, even if it is small, if you are unsure, you know, you can still ask. And then maybe it may be that when you clarify everything, it is okay. But, you know, uh, we still encourage it and it's not too small and don't be embarrassed and, you know, just bring it up if you're, if you're bothered or if you're uncomfortable. Yeah. Thank you. Bernice, anything? Um, I think for the inertia part, I think the things that really help me are the words consent and boundaries, which are always being practiced anyway, right? So we might have inertia when it comes to thinking of like being very trusting in our culture, which is great on the one hand, um, but just recognizing that there are always by default levels of consent that we're giving and different types of boundaries that we're enacting, like personal space boundaries, mm. right? And, and just seeing them as already existing and seeing that we're already practicing them might be helpful for thinking about how we overcome this like, oh, everything's fine feeling. Yeah. Um, with disclosure, I mean, I, I, have, I have to just say that AWARE's first responders training was really helpful. Um, and that in Singapore, there are several layers that we can, you know, there are several ways that we can go about it. And at my house, there's this bus stop sign that says, what happens if someone crosses the line? Call the line, right? This is tough app, right? So, so I think that there's an, a growing awareness, as we can see. Um, yeah. Yeah, but, thank you. But I, I think yeah. if I can just add a little bit more, that, that reluctance is really uh, real, right? Uh, yeah. And unfortunately, sometimes the circle is very small, right? So, so if I'm in, uh, 
in athletics, I, I know if I bring this up, everybody will know mm. that I'm the one who, who, who says it, right? Mm. Uh, and I don't want also, because of the power differential, I don't want anything to happen to my coach, right? So I, I'm fearful of that, right? Mm. So because of that, we have independent. So if you establish, and say Sport Commission is that independent thing, so we are not affiliated to swimming, Singapore Swimming Association, we're not affiliated to Basketball Association. So somebody, uh, if something happens to somebody in a basketball setting, they don't have to tell them, right? They can come to us. And it becomes, if you are not willing to report it formally, then uh, it can be just be a disclosure. And we, as a Safe Sport Commission, we can act on it whilst retaining the confidentiality. So I think that will increase that confidence and reduce that reluctance in wanting to uh, report. Yeah, because it's a close community. Everybody knows everybody else. So sometimes that becomes something that hinders uh, uh, people from wanting to, to, to come out and speak out. Yeah, that's like that in the arts as well. And so you're like an ombudsman kind of situation, right? Where you allow for varied people to come without a partiality towards any particular one. This is obviously a conversation that can continue. Uh, and needs to continue and will continue. But I want to start by saying a very big thank you to all three of you, Atta, Bernice and Deborah. Welcome. Um, because it really helps to get the juices thinking and, and moving along. Thank you very much to all of you who are present and to all of you who are uh, participating online. Over to you, Tabitha. Thank you, Charlene. Thank you so much, Charlene and panelists, Atta, Deborah and uh, Bernice for your invaluable insights. Thank you, everybody. Please share your feedback with us through the QR code on the screen or the link in the chat. Your feedback will help SDEA continue to offer better support and programs. If you haven't already, please do join SDEA as a member and receive discounts on SDEA signature and training programs, including theatre arts conference and essentials of teaching and learning approaches, access to quarterly members engagement events and networking sessions resources to forms and lead interest groups. Also for donations, SDA attained charity status in 2020, and we are en route to attaining our Institute of Public Character status. If you believe in our mission and the impact of drama and applied theatre, please consider supporting us and keep our work going. The QR codes are found on the screen and link are found in the group chat. For those staying back for Conversation Circle 2, we will take a 15-minute break. Please be back by 3.45 p.m. If you did not sign up for Conversation Circle 2 on what's next for the sector and you would like to join, please feel free to stay behind. We will assign you to a breakout group. Thank you, everyone. Have a good break.